Okay, guys, welcome back to another one of our, our podcasts. We're very, very lucky again to be joined by uh, a, a, another great lad who's been involved in football and soccer in different parts of the world. Uh, Joshua Lee, who I actually met in the States coaching at a club level and kind of travel coaching around. And I went through different agencies to come out and coach in the US. Uh, and again, has, has gone a different, a different way around the world, ladies and gentlemen, to kind of take his, his football background and, and his coaching background uh, around the world to, to go and uh, coach soccer to, to a load of kids and, and have a massive impact on their lives. So, so Josh, mate, lovely to hear from your pal on the call. Lovely to have you on, mate. Uh, first of all, you want to just talk about yourself for a minute again. Another lad who, very humble, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't really like talking about himself, but uh, once we get him started, hopefully he'll, he'll be uh, free flowing. So, Josh, let's talk about your, yourself, mate, where you're from, a bit of background information and kind of, you know, the, the different roles you've had in the game and, and where they've been and how they come about, mate. Uh, thank you, firstly, for having me on. That. Um, my name is Josh, as obviously Matt's mentioned. I'm 22, uh, a graduate from Sheffield. Um, recently just graduated from Leeds Beckett University um, with a grade of a 2-2. Um, but obviously going on and starting from my home life, um, I came from a single-parent background. Um, my dad left when I was quite young, so I didn't really have that male uh, father figure. So my granddad stepped up, and that's how I fell in love with football. Um, I remember the first time I actually stepped foot on a football pitch was for a local team called Green on the Wedges, which were probably one of the best sides in Sheffield at the time when I was growing up. It was filled with lots of lads that then went on to play at academy level um, and have quite good careers, obviously, until the age of like 18, 19, when a lot of people get cut off. Um, I was there at Green Hill for roughly around two to three years until around the age of nine, ten years old. Um soon realised that I wasn't getting enough game time to develop my career, especially as a player. Because obviously at a young age, I think a lot of people, a lot of lads as well, and even girls nowadays, dream of being a footballer when they're older. Um, so I then moved to a another Sunday league club in Sheffield called Dromfield Town. Um, at the age of about 10 or 11. Uh, stayed there until the age of 16. Was captain, took the team up three or four divisions um, and built quite a strong uh, relationship with uh, my first coach, Ian Feeley, he was um, probably one of the most influential managers that I've worked under in terms of how he helped me develop as a player and as a coach, obviously growing older. And we're going to him quite a few times and have a career, not just in, as a footballer, but as a coach. And he, he remember him sat me down a couple of times and explained what I needed to do, you know, the opportunities that I needed to take, where I needed to go, and really set me on that sort of coaching path to start off with. Um, unfortunately, Dromfield folded uh, just the year before under 18. So obviously, when a lot of players are looking to to try and move up divisions and stuff and play at the highest level, I was fortunate enough then to um, go and sign for Sheffield United Junior Blades, um, who had a, a tie at the time with Hallam FC, which is the one of the one of the oldest football clubs in the world. I know it's the oldest derby in the world, and and that's with Sheffield FC. So that was quite a, a good moment for me in my, in my playing career um, obviously playing for um, Hallam was always a, a nice thing to do so yeah my football career I've moved quite a bit obviously staying around Sheffield not really leaving up until I went to university um, but the real start point for my coaching career I think was when I was lucky enough to do two football tours um, the first I must have been like year 10 or I think it was year 10 we managed to go to Feyenoord, which is in, in Holland, and get coached by a lot of coaches that probably had top-level licences. So you're looking at EUA for Bs, A's, pro licences, uh, and, and learned a lot through the their way of coaching. And then two years later, we did another tour to Espanyol through school in sixth form. Um, and once again, obviously getting coached by a lot of coaches that, again, had these big licences sort of made me want to not necessarily just focus solely on coaching because still at that point I think everyone still has a, a slimmer of hope that they might get picked up but I think it sort of really turned my attention to to more of a coaching aspect um, so yeah that's really and mainly my football background and a bit about my family life obviously like I said at the start being from a single parent background and I owe a lot of respect and dedication to my mum and my granddad who used to take me here there and everywhere and who have paid for me to have so many opportunities in just one sport I'm really privileged and proud to have them as parents and grandparents. 
No, it's great stuff, man. Again, listen to speak, mate. It's, uh, makes makes me proud, mate, to kind of know you and, and whatnot, and obviously your roots in and stuff, and it's been a different route, but yeah, the success you've got to go, mate, it's been great to credit to you and your family. Obviously, I know, I know you're very close to your mum and your granddad. And again, we just speak about that, the support network. Obviously, we talked to a lot of, of you know, pro footballers or ex-pro footballers or, or coaches and, and anyone really that we spoke to speaks about the importance of that support network and obviously how it's such a, a commitment, even at, at kind of club level, club, club soccer, as, as the US uh, people would know, kind of over, uh, over in the States where, you know, in England, it, is, it is different, it's, it's very religious as such, where people are, you know, playing at kind of grassroots from their league, and if they're lucky enough to get into academy where I was, and obviously going through the, the stages, you do need that support and that backing from parents and family, or or even friends to kind of help you get get through it and uh, and push you on. And obviously, just talking about there, Josh, where in year 10 as such, uh, 10th graders, as the US would know, kind of the age of, you know, 14, 15, where back in the day where, where school kind of finished at 16, where it's obviously been ex extended now to 18 to kind of uh, match up with, with the American yeah. system and way. I mean, you went out to a football tour, you said a soccer tour to, you know, to lots of final in, in Holland and in Espanol and in Spain. Uh, I can remember, you know, schools offer a lot of opportunities for, for kids then, but again, a difference made between opportunity and, and taking it. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of guys on that tour who went with you who, who maybe now haven't got any career in, in the game whatsoever. And again, the fact you went there and you were able to kind of be inspired and it obviously inspired you to then go and get, you know, some, some coaching badges and get out in the world. I mean, just talk about, Joshy, you know, the, the, the badges you've gone and got, uh, you know, the, the, the impact that trips like that had on you. And then obviously some of the places you've, you've kind of gone now and, and gone and coached, obviously we, we met in Chicago, uh, you know, obviously two lads from England, you from Sheffield and myself from London, you know, what are the chances of, of us meeting out in, in Chicago, in the States to go and coach, but we did it. And again, it's kind of becoming quite a common theme now. Just talk about, you know, your, your badges uh, that you've got and, and obviously some of the places you've gone and coached in the world and, and how you managed to get yourself out there, mate. I mean, I've been quite fortunate to, um, to go with the places that I've been. I've only got my level one, um, I focused a lot on university. I did four years at university instead of three. I finished my first year and didn't get like through university. So I took the time then to make a decision whether just to go down the coaching route or to go back to university and, and try again. And obviously took the, the opportunity to go back to university and start again afresh with a different course for another three years. Um, so like I've just said, I've, I only really got my level one. So I've been quite fortunate to coach in two different continents really considering that a lot of people that I went out there with like yourself you know you've got your UA for B I've only got my level one and obviously you come up with a lot of people you know I've met the likes of Greg Barley who again he's got American and English licenses of a quality coach Ben Wainwright's another one that I worked with in America and Sean Doyle you know it's always about the people that you meet and not necessarily looking at a piece of paper that says look you've only got this you know you learn so much from everybody like I learned a lot from you in my first it was my first week in Chicago obviously being away from home for the for the first time obviously abroad and obviously knowing that you're not going to be able to to get on a train or a short plane journey home it's always nice to know that you've got support in fellow coaches as well well um so obviously again sticking with that sort of uh, um, university tie I was lucky enough to to trial for the university team Lee's Beckett has probably one of the top football setups in the country fortunately um you know over the over the years that I was there, I didn't get in first year, um, but they won. I think they won like a, a national tournament for the first team and stuff. So obviously, I've been fortunate enough to be surrounded by a lot of great coaches. The first one that springs to mind when you mention the university is Graham Potter. He actually coached for the university, not while I was necessarily there, but you know he's a high-profile name that's now managing in the Premier League for Brighton. Um, so my main coaches that I actually took a lot from, especially at university and doing a coaching course were like to John Hall, who was UA for B, I believe, or maybe even UA for A qualified coach. He did a lot for the football club, you know, spent tireless hours behind the scenes. But also, obviously, when you go to one of his sessions, you take away so much. Um, you've got Sam Norris, who was my actual first year coach. He has just completed his UA for B. You know, he's now coaching teams at semi-professional level so he took a big step up um chris Wellburn, i remember he was a an fa like coordinator he did a lot for the fa another great coach and then obviously with the university obviously wanting to progress to these coaches at a younger age we had the likes of ollie parker and, and adam varvel who were very young, more young coaches but again wanted to get the foot on the ladder and climb their way up so obviously it's nice that you have that sort of mixture of coaching ages and abilities in terms of everyone brings something different to the table that's allowed me to then take a lot away and coach over, obviously overseas more than here obviously when I was a quite a young 
well, quite a bit younger, sorry, should I say. I had an opportunity to work with Sheffield United for on work experience uh, for a week coaching and obviously using that sort of community aspect and going and doing sort of, again, like soccer camps in the holidays for kids and not really just being able to just observe like coaches that are, again, more qualified than I am and taking a lot away from that and then that sort of wanted me to then start my own coaching career. So I remember taking a small job with the team that I actually played for at the time, John Fieldfield Town. They had a, a nursery squad um, and I obviously said I'll volunteer, I'll, well, I'll volunteer, sorry, should I say, <laughs> to um, obviously coach that. I was there for roughly around a year, brought my sister into football, um, which was obviously nice, obviously, to continue that like, sort of the, the family going in terms of that football background, which meant my mum and my granddad could once again, like, again, be a support for another child in the family. Um, but yeah, so obviously I've gone from journeys of staying in England with Drumfield Town, then progressed to Sheffield Wednesday Ladies. Um, my sister got to the point where she wasn't always being utilised very well. So similar to myself, she wasn't getting much game time. She was playing the team where she was the youngest, the year below everybody else. So they've matured a year more. Apparently they've got more football knowledge. So I remember sitting my mum and my granddad down and saying, look, for the sake of her career, and we need to probably move her away. And took her to Sheffield Wednesday and then they had a position for a coach going for the actual team that my sister was going into. So I took that with both hands and had a couple of other coaches who actually helped so there was it was a free coach team um obviously with me and commitments to university i wasn't there all the time um and i stayed coaching that, that team i'd say for roughly around two years um before handing my actual team over to a, another gentleman called michael colton who's become a very big close friend of my my family's and and again has took a leisure on leaps and bounds which is always nice that you can have that sort of confidence to hand the team over to someone that can do a better job than you can and obviously progress that certain team forward and then obviously he's made swaps and changes and really really made that team into sort of power powerhouse team in the Sheffield Female League um, and then really just went cold coaching for a year I'd say until obviously my first year in America in 2017 uh, where I met you with the likes of yourself Sean Doyle and other people that I've already mentioned in the podcast so you know I think I've been on a bit of a, a journey up and down the coaching aspect really you know I started off quite low coached at a couple of teams that are obviously known professionally like Sheffield Wednesday and Sheffield United and obviously having ties with them um, you know and then obviously going to America I coached soccer camps for Chicago Fire they're another professional organisation um, and doing their camps and then obviously spending time with Orland Park in my first year and I managed to get a really good job working with uh, the American Youth Soccer Organisation uh, more specifically, AYSO 300 in the in the fall of my second year out there in 2018. Uh, so that was really good, obviously, being in a more professional background than just your usual rep soccer over in America and having an understanding of travel teams. And obviously, I'm, again, looking to head back out anywhere, really. I'm looking at all avenues. Obviously, at the moment, I'm currently a, a teacher, uh, but obviously, I'm wanting to be able to, to stick with sort of what I've qualified in at university, which is obviously coaching. So, you know, I've been very fortunate to progress from just a normal recreational Sunday league team to then being able to have an understanding of what it's like to run a, you know, a travel team and to be associated with those. So, yeah, my coaching background's been it's on a roller coaster up and down, but um, hopefully I get some more qualifications done because I can't do much more than what I've done on a level one. So, obviously, looking in the future, getting my level two done, then my B crew and my A licence as well. Nice, no, great insight, man. Again, just hearing, hearing your whole story, Josh, I know you're well, mate. I can remember when you first came out to the States as a, as a young kid as such, you know, 22, 23, and you were, you were brought up bushy tail, man. You, you were just a sponge. I, mean, I, I can remember obviously listening to you and talking to you. You could see that you're a very intelligent kid. And anyone that kind of gets out in the world at whatever age, but especially young as you were, has obviously got something about them to go out and, and do that. And again, I can remember you, you were just taking things in and listening and, and obviously implementing things and trying things and asking questions. And, and that's what it's about, ladies and gentlemen, really. Obviously, for the, for the players and, and the parents and anyone listening, it's obviously what you know it is, is crucial. Obviously, you, know, you need to have that insight and stuff. But obviously, when, when you're starting from the bottom, 
you know, you, you maybe don't know too much, and, and you're trying to learn, and obviously, who knows Colossal too, but, you know, the, the, obviously, nowadays, people look at what you've got in terms of badges and paperwork, as Josh said, I mean, there are bits of paper, but obviously, ultimately, they can help you get places. In order to get around you, you have to kind of put yourself out there and network, and, and Josh is someone who, as I say, started from the, the bottom, and obviously, he's maybe had a various different roles, but he's climbed the ladder bit by bit, and, and taken on different bits of advice with different people, and, and using it now for himself, where he's now in a position where, you know, he's, he's very close to, if not, being able to get his way for B, uh, and obviously, then going to go get his A license and, and obviously get that paper which he needs to then go and, and progress in terms of uh, all of that side but just again talk, talk about us there Josh how, how the whole moves to, to America come about I mean how, how did you kind of get put in contact with, with the likes of the organisations you needed to get out to the States obviously those that are looking to maybe come, come and play in the States we've got different podcasts for that and, and those that are looking to kind of you know come out and coach we, we can really talk about that now in terms of the, the agencies you went through and, and how you went, went and got it done and how you got out to the States to coach in the first place so I'm very fortunate that my personal tutor through university was someone that had a, well, two personal tutors that I went to quite often, um, had a very keen interest in, in football. Um, Jamie Poulton was the one that, again, spoke to me briefly about furthering your career. You can't just necessarily stay and just coach here. Obviously, everyone, I think everyone who's a coach knows that you don't know where your next job's going to be. You know, if you're in a professional field, you know, your, your jobs could take you from I don't know, Spain to Portugal, England to America. You know, you, you look at Chicago Fires, old coach. Uh, is, it, is it Paunovic? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, Hungarian, yeah. You know, he's, I think he's Hungarian, Eastern European sort of player person who's gone across. You know, he played for Atletico Madrid and then ended up coaching in America. I think, obviously, in that sort of mindset, um, you can go anywhere. So he was fortunate enough to say to me, look, there's a couple of organisations that that you can go through in order to, to maybe even coach abroad if you consider that and put me in contact with Yes Soccer um, who invited me down to do um, an invitational day so where you obviously coach and whether they basically say whether you're good enough to go out or not um, unfortunately I got through that stage um, in February I think it was February 2017 I did my ID day at uh, Aston Villa's ground again another professional setup where you get to see all the facilities that the the first team is used and stuff like that, so that's a bit surreal as a young coach. Um, and then, obviously, after my ID day, I had to go through all my fees application uh, in order to get out there. And then, yeah, I was just very fortunate that my my personal tutors at university were very football orientated and and put me in the right direction in order to to further my career, especially not necessarily just in terms of getting the qualifications, which is something that I will do later on in life, but in order to get like the experience that you also need on your CV. You know, a lot of people have said that it's all well and good having all your licences, but if you haven't done an ounce of coaching, a lot of people might look and just go, he's just, a, he's just got the paperwork, but what experience do we need? So it's about balancing out both. Um, so at the moment, I think I've got quite a lot of experience. Obviously, I want to gain more as I grow older, but at the same time, go and get more qualifications and, and become a more well-rounded coach. No, of course, mate. As I say, it's that balance part, obviously, you know, wanting to get out and coach, but obviously getting the, getting the qualifications too. And as you say, it's all well and good. You kind of link it to a, a driving test, mate. It's all well and good doing your theory, you know, the, the badges and whatnot. But if you've got no kind of driving experience as such, no coaching experience, you know, you, how, how are you going to implement it with the kids and how are you going to help them? Because obviously, you know, as people know in terms of even driving, to link it to that, I mean, there's a difference between doing the, the bookwork and the theory and actually getting out in the, in the big bad world and actually doing your test and, and driving the real world. So it is, it is that fine balance for us. And you speak about your pathway there, mate, in terms of knowing people. Obviously, I, I know, again, that you've gone out through that way and obviously people you, you knew had set you up. But even getting out, you, you've met different people. And just talk about now, Josh, the, the initiative you've shown, mate, to kind of go on the likes of Google, where you know everyone's kind of got access to that, to, to Google and sites of the other search engines where you can go on Google and on other, other methods to kind of search these agencies. How you've, how you've now gone and found different uh, platforms, different companies, likes, you know, in, in China and Dubai, which we've discussed, where you're looking at now kind of going out to and coaching to really further that resume. I mean, how, how, did you, how did you find these other companies which are now looking at and exploring to go out to different parts of the world to, to go and coach? I think it's usually part of your initiative. You know, I, I'm very interested in coaching all over the world. You know, every single country will have a different philosophy. Every team has a different philosophy. And every manager or coach has a different philosophy. I think it's all about balancing it out obviously if you can get round the world at quite a young age and just coach even if it's just a recreational aspect or even if you go higher and go and coach in academies if you've got the qualifications and I think it's all about using your initiative obviously when I did America the first year uh, my actual what I wanted to do the second year was go and coach in Canada again it's, it's the neighbourhood country 
to America, but again, it'll have a completely different philosophy of how they play football or soccer. Um, and then obviously, I've coached with coaches from Argentina, from Brazil, from Italy, all over the world. You know, like I said, I've done football tours to Europe and stuff, and then obviously experienced what it's like to, to coach in the States. I think I wasn't very settled. I wanted to I wanted to try new areas, so obviously looking at the likes of Australia and New Zealand to go out and coach and look at the opportunities there on Google and use that sort of platform. And a lot of people now use LinkedIn. You know, that's a very big aspect for coaches to to connect with other coaches that may be looking for the same opportunities or even advertising opportunities that you might take nice. uh, with both hands. So fortunately for me, yeah, no, great. With, Great insight, mate. No, sorry, sorry to cut off there, Josh. Great insight, mate. Obviously, how you go and do it. Obviously, I mean, just talk there, Josh. Obviously, in terms of the actual, uh, the, the nitty gritty, in terms of what you even put in the search engines. Obviously, there's, there's a difference between using Google, but what kind of you know words do you, do you put them in? Is is it as simple as kind of typing in coaching football soccer in the states? That like, does that kind of help, or is it as sim- Is it is it kind of more difficult than that to kind of get put in contact with, with these companies who can give you the roles? How, what what kind of things would, would you put in Google to to go and get these roles around the world? You know, I think it's all about looking at the actual opportunities that young coaches can get. Um, I've always been one for saying that, you know, you look at how many different nationalities coaches are, it's all about that aspect of there's people from all over the world coaching in some of your top divisions. You know, you look at the Prem and you look at how many foreign coaches that you've got and you appreciate each and every one of them for being something different. But obviously looking at Google, all that I used to type in was, uh, like, coaching opportunities. You know, there's a lot of... Um, like summer camps in terms of like if you look at uh, Camp America you can literally just type that in and about 15 different companies come up so obviously looking more at a football and soccer aspect you can look at it through you know your job search engines you can look at it through Google and just type it in you, you know Google comes up with millions of different things so it's all about like picking them out going through spending some time you know it's not the most interesting of things but obviously going through and finding different companies and what they will offer you in different countries it's amazing, you know, you can get companies that will offer you coaching roles in South Africa and in, in, in Africa in general and stuff like that. So it's it's all about obviously trying to narrow it down, doing a bit of research, looking at different organisations and where they will put you. Um, so obviously mine for Yes Soccer, I sort of knew that America would be the destination because that's where they send a lot of their coaches, if not all of their coaches. It was just mainly my sort of... Um, insight was where will I be based and they said you could be based anywhere around the Midwest obviously I know that um, other coaches maybe get sent like Pennsylvania and other states through uh, other companies you know you've got Challenger you've got UK International and you've got like Premier League China that do all the stuff through there so um, I met someone uh, while doing a, a youth sports trust course um, who was actually very lucky he was part of Premier League he was part of like, the Premier League setup, and he went out to China and coached. So, you know, I've got friends that have coached in many different countries. So, again, it's all about not necessarily what you know, but who you know, if they can put you into contact with people that can help if you want to coach in several different countries and continents. No, that's it, mate. Great insight. So, I speak about that, obviously, that initiative to go out and, and even type basic things to Google, like, you know, coaching opportunities and, and things that come up, and obviously then exploring them and looking, and obviously then you, the, the people you meet throughout kind of obviously grows and, and helps you grow it. And, and again, mate, as someone who's kind of witnessed your growth, even even in the last couple of years, I mean, you're developing, mate, into a fantastic young coach. And obviously, it's a matter of time, as you said, before you get your, your badges and obviously your big roles and big breaks in in, uh, in pro football. And we, we spoke to uh, Pedro, Pedro Villa Roldan the other day, mate, who, who I'm very close to, who had a very good career at Racing Santander. As a, as a player and, and come out to the States and played and he's now coaching out in the States himself and he's very close with uh, top level players and, and coaches the likes of uh, Sergio Canales mate and, and he's very close with uh, Kike Setien who's the current FC Barcelona manager which is a, a good podcast worth listening to it again ladies and gentlemen and, and he just speaks about there uh, Josh how you know, Kike maybe again wasn't from the, the most uh, you know rich or, or, or kind of upbringings where you know he's, he's put into uh, bigger things Little alarm goes there, Josh, was it? <laughs> yeah, no, we're talking about Kike Sati in there, Josh. Obviously, you know, he's someone who, who didn't come from the, the most, uh, you know, 
privileged background, but started off similar to you, mate, kind of where he's, he's working with young young kids at kind of rec level, you know, recreational level and helping them. And he's just built and built and built and, and got into himself into roles and obviously built, boosted his resume and, and met people and coached a higher level throughout and, and improved himself and whatnot and, and got to a level when he's in working for Real Betis and now the top job at, at FC Barcelona. And it, it just shows, mate, that endeavour and obviously that willingness to, to learn and be open to improve and obviously put yourself out there and network. And there's, there's not even kind of, we speak about players, what is the one thing that players need? I mean, there's a, there's a whole multitude of things. And if, if you just focus on one thing, you, you're going to sell yourself short and you, you kind of need to really, really be open to all the, the different things that come your way and really kind of immerse yourself in it, which again, Don Coleman spoke about the other day, immerse himself in, in goalkeeping and, and coaching in general and really learn as much as you can and meet as many people as you can to, to further yourself. And as someone now, Josh, who, as I say, I mean, the, the, the insight you've now gained from your travels and your journeys and what you've gone and done, I mean, what advice do you give as a coach, mate, to players? And what, what advice would you give to, to players yourself or someone that was a player and, and someone that was a coach? And, and again, on the flip side, as parents, I mean, what, what advice would you give to parents who are looking to kind of really progress and, and help their kids out? Well, going, obviously, in terms of looking at what I, what I say to players first, I think always, I think the biggest thing is always believe in yourself. If you have a, if you self-doubt things and if you have doubt about what you're doing, um, I think that's always going to be your first sort of stopping barrier um, in terms of how you're going to progress as a, as a player growing up um, so yeah just always believe in yourself you know I went through I went through school with, with a lot of people saying that you're not going to amount to anything and I took the I sort of believed them and, and just sort of went along with playing at a, a Sunday league level when if I look back if I push myself more maybe if I spent more time you know doing independent drills and and more dedication to football, maybe I'd be in a different position than I am now. Um, you know, in, in England, especially, you've got so many academies, but it's so hard to get into them. You, you know, you've got to really stand out, and the kids that do stand out are the ones that often have self belief and believe in everything that they do. And I'm not saying go in there with a, an overconfident, cocky attitude because that'll get stamped out by coaches pretty quickly. Uh, but obviously, believing yourself is number one. Number two, I think, obviously, is again listening and looking at assessments when a coach says something to you it's not necessarily going to be to to bring you down a peg or two or to make you feel like you're not a good player I think a lot of coaches have that problem with maybe kids automatically jump to the defensive especially when they're in the teenage years where they think oh coach don't think I'm any good or you know he, he might just pick up on a negative and not necessarily a positive um, but yeah I think for like players there's so many different avenues that you can do to become better overall and I think the main one for them obviously is like I said self-belief uh, hard work is a massive one you know if you look at the story of Gary Neville when he was in the Man United Academy he wasn't the best footballer in the world but he worked so hard he, you know he got given a contract based on his on his hard work and again his footballing ability became better because he worked hard he listened to his coaches and he took on board um criticisms when it was given you know if you look at that that sort of class of 92 you look at all like the Nicky Brook Beckham Nevilles and stuff like that and the Skulls you look at those players that have come through they've obviously come through a good coaching network but again they've sort of had that sort of self-belief that they can go far and they have listened to their coaches and that's one of the key things that will make you improve as a player overall um, going on to more of a parent side of it I think obviously I'm I've been fortunate enough to, when I have been living in America, I've lived with host families, so people that have actually let me come into their family life and live with them for a, a specific amount of time, whether it be a week, a month, three weeks, two weeks, or whatever. Um, you know, and you get you get to learn different how parents take on football. Some parents are very, very laid back, and they let the kid just, you know, do what they need to do, and they go and watch, and they'll praise, and they'll cheer, and then you get parents who are a bit more stern, and you know, really sort of sit them down and say, look, son, daughter, this is where you went right, wrong. And I think it's always finding that sort of right balance, you know, mm -hmm. making sure that you let your kid enjoy, you know, when they're playing soccer or football, but also giving them your own personal feedback. You know, a, a lot of parents will give feedback that may go against what a coach says. So obviously then that might put the kid in a bit of disarray in terms of, well, who do I listen to? I know I had that problem. Uh, last season with my sister and the manager obviously me with my coaching head I had things to say to Alicia that might have gone against what 
uh, Alicia's manager had said, and obviously I've apologised for that if that's gone against that. But I think it's just finding that right balance between being involved and being positive with your with your child, but also not obviously overstepping the mark and being too sort of like um, involved. Obviously finding that balance. You want to you want the best for your child. But I think sometimes you just need to let the coach do his job. Um, you know, and once the coach does his job, if you're if you've got anything extra to give, then maybe that's the time after the game, maybe where you sit them down and, and speak to them, but obviously not going to, being too harsh and being too in, over-involved, but also not being under-involved. Because obviously a kid could look to you as a parent, as a role model, and might want to impress you as well. So obviously staying involved with soccer might be a big thing for the child. No, that's great insight, Josh. Again, someone who's, who's been a player and coach, and even now maybe a, a parent, I'd be yourself to, to your younger sister. I mean, again, it's interesting hearing you talk, mate, how how easy of a trap it is to fall in, where even as a coach, maybe you kind of go against uh, what other coaches are, are telling you, your sister, where obviously you're trying to help her. And again, it, it, as as so many people have said on these podcasts, man, as we speak to them, in, in any level of, of football that we've spoken to, that, that key word balance, mate, obviously, again, with, with parents and players alike, where you know, you're trying to get the best out of your kid, but how do you do that? I and mean, obviously, there, there's times to push, but again, at the same time, if you push too hard, kids can be broken and it can it can be detriment to them so it is finding that balance between pushing but pushing not too not not too hard and and letting them make their their own choice and again uh, on a flip side just as a coach i mean it's, it's so important that you know parents aren't alienated because obviously again you know parents spend the most time with their kids they want to learn obviously they, again they've got to be involved and it's just so important for coaches to actually coach the parent as much as the kid and educate them and make sure that the advice they're giving is on the same level because obviously parents want to help their kids and, and if 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 uh parents get alienated by coaches they're going to give advice which doesn't add up because they're trying to help and maybe their their insight isn't as as good as it could be and it's just so important mate to get everyone on the same path and the same point as a coach and obviously players parents coaches alike and everyone moving moving forward and uh just before we end the call josh i mean obviously mate great call over there pal great insight into different routes into the game obviously your, your expertise obviously what you're going to learn has has been fantastic and continues to be so so credit to you mate and again you we wish you every success and, and congratulate you on what, you, what you've done so far. You deserve it all, mate. And, and just kind of, what, what would you like to leave viewers and listeners now on, mate, in terms of the game and obviously the path that you've taken? What, what would Josh, uh, what, what, what would Joshua Lee like to kind of give people before we, we end this call? I think it's just sort of looking at, it doesn't matter what background you come from, sort of what race you are, gender, whatever you believe in. If you want to be a coach, then you sort of go for it. There's nothing really that can stop you apart from yourself. You know, you look a lot at, at people and a big talking point has been sort of can a woman do a job as a coach in a men's league and I've, and I've always been the type of person that's gone yes absolutely I think nothing should hold you back in life no matter what it is and I think um, even for people playing again like I said earlier just self belief believe in yourself and don't be influenced by what you hear from peers from your friends from other teams that might not necessarily like you. I think it's all about yourself. You know, it's not in terms of I'm not saying you've got to look after yourself because obviously football and soccer is a very team orientated game. But obviously, just for me, I think just to end on uh, is just believe in yourself. And obviously, just before I end, just furthermore onto like a coach sort of relationship and coach parent relationship. I think that's majorly important as well for a coach to to look at improving. Obviously, being in a in a team, it's important, like you said a minute ago, to get the kids involved just as much as it is the parents. So I think obviously football is sort of like a family sport. You should incorporate every single person, regardless of, again, race, religion, gender, everything. I think it should be a family sport and everyone should be involved. So for me, I think it's just all about like cohesion and making sure that um, you know everyone's in it together and you work hard as a team. And obviously, if you look at individual players, make sure you believe in yourself. No, great stuff, mate. I mean, wise words, pal. I mean, you're still a young man yourself. I mean, I'm, I'm only young myself at 27, but you're even younger than me. And again, very, very wise words. And you know, from a guy who, who has come from very humble beginnings and gone out and, and really is, is achieving great things in, in the world of football and soccer and obviously in terms of his, his life now and, and what he's doing. So, Josh, great mindset, mate. Great mentality. Again, it's, it's so important to have that mentality of obviously, you know, not, not letting the bad times bring you down too much and not, not letting the good times kind of you know, uh, overwhelm you so much and, and keeping that balance and, and making sure that you overcome any obstacle and it's in your way. And, and again, just really, really appreciate coming on the call, mate. And uh, we wish you all the best going forward, pal. It's been a pleasure, Matt. Thank you ever so much.